Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's by Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. November night slips down on Broadway, a gust of blackness. And at once, Broadway is a neon-lighted revival meeting that screams for the joy and the salvation. Then the happy trumpet yells and makes the music of the nighttime. Ebbs into the darkness, drifts and dies. And to my window at headquarters, I watched it. Watched a man detach himself from it, turn and stand for an instant in the sallow pool of light from the street lamp and consider it. Turn again and up the steps, and in a little while, open my door because you've been told to see me. Mr. Clover. Come in. You know all about me, don't you? Not a thing. Who are you? What do you mean, not a thing? I'm Mr. Bryant. And? Well, you know about me, about my wife. Why do you think I was in here yesterday? Tell you people a bunch of lies? Well, you talked to someone else. I didn't know a thing about you. My wife. She didn't come home. She hasn't come home, Mr. Clover. I see. You reported a day ago. Yes. Clara went out the other evening. I, I waited for her. Billy's been waiting. Billy? Three and a half, going on four. The second one, really. Our first child didn't even get born... See, Why did you come to see me, Mr. Bryant? The man in the other office told me. Please find her. Please find Clara, Mr. Culver. She's got to come home, Mr. Culver, because... The man in the other office said to show you the letter. Here, open it and read it. Hmm? As you see, the man who wrote the letter says he knows where my wife is. He says his name is Shorty Dunn. And he says, come to the Apollo Hotel. What does that mean? And bring money. That's strange. It says, come to the Apollo Hotel, but it's written on Mission House Stationery. And bring money. That's why I came to the police again. Although I am worried about my wife, I have my head about me. You, the police, you'll find the car. And you'll come home to us, then. You fellas are good. Find her. Find her. Find her. Find her. <laughs> Suddenly, the spill of words stopped flowing from him. It became a moan. It became the whisper of the helpless. Its component parts, defiance, the shame. This was the universal currency of men who must beg, to appease hunger, to barter dignity, to blot out the sudden emptiness. I told him I'd check on it, try to find his wife for him, talk to the man who had written the letter. He accepted the alms I had given him, went away. The Apollo Hotel stands on a corner of the Bowery and sells men sleep at 50 cents a night. You walk up a flight of stairs, the grit under your feet screeching your presence. And at the landing, a desk, moist with the sweat of hands that have bargained across it. The back of it, the man with the green eye shade, the broken, restless fingers, the vendor of sleep. Go away, we'll full up every bed in the house. I want Shorty Dunn, is he here? You talk like you got a right to want somebody. Police. Yeah, I know. You know how I know? Because I'm sensitive to the sound feet make on my stairs. Without looking up, I can tell is it a rummy, a wino, a bum, a cop. You want Shorty, huh? Yeah. Imagine that. Shorty finally made it. Somebody wants him. <laughs> Come on. Bed 12. Distressing, ain't a policeman? The way a man comes in here for four bits worth of sleep and something won't let him. It bothers you? You'd be astonished how it bothers me. Yeah. Bed 12. Shorty done. Hey, Shorty. Hey, wake up. It's a day of miracles is here. You got a visitor. Asleep. Shorty? Well, what do you know about that? I can't hear you, Kenny. Look at him. Like a baby. The jackknife in his heart finally brought it to him. Yeah. You wanted him, policeman. Take him away so I can sell his bed all over again. That's how it was that a stir was created in the Apollo Hotel. Wino is murdered, and a respectable housewife disappears. What element is common to both? Consider now the letter to Mr. Bryan written on Mission House Stationery, 10th Avenue. Go there. And the man is standing there smiling and waiting for you to come to him. My name is Paul Foster. You're welcome here. Well, thanks, sir. I'm Danny Clover, police. I hope there's no trouble. I'm trying to get some information about a man. So many men come in here for a hot meal or shoes. 
friendliness when we feel it will be accepting. A newspaper, little thing, sometimes even a job. Mostly, we try to give away dignity. I know. You people do wonderful things. Thank you. Uh, what man did you want to ask me about? Shorty Dunn. There's nothing I can tell you to start me about Shorty. Of course, I can show you a written record on him. He's been rehabilitated about seven times, which is about normal. When did you see him last? Last night. It was very late. We had no bed for him. Uh, he slept at the Apollo Hotel. I'm glad he did. I give him a half a dollar to find himself a bed. I, I'm glad he used it for that. He was found stabbed to death. Betty. It's gotten so that when I hear of death, well, the lives of these men are a pity. They're dying. I, I don't know what to say anymore. He wrote a letter before he walked out of here, didn't he? That's right, he did. He told me it was very important, and I give him the stationery and enough stamps to send the letter special delivery. Huh. Do you know anything else about him? Not much. There's a bar down the street, Goldie, it's called. Shorty swept out and whatever else needed to be done in places like that. You might try that. Stab to death. It's a pity. As a lady who's had lookers look at her before. You're Goldie. The one and only. Didn't call me that because I got a heart of gold and teeth to match what's left of them. <laughs> See? Pure gold. My dowry to some lookers in. Goldie, I... Uh... You want to marry me, lookers. I've been searching for the likes of you. They told me at the mission how Shorty Dunn works here sometimes. Goldie. Shut up, lovely. Listen, that is our song, so it is mine. The newspaper we set to that. He's dead, Goldie. Murdered. You didn't need to tell me that. I knew about it. The gent brought me word. They lap up my beer and give me the world. Tell me about him. Your relative? Police. Danny Clover. That makes you a relative. Shorty was an old friend of yours. My fiancé. Many days stood right there at the bar rail, just where you're standing, and proposed to me on bended knees. But you didn't marry him. Shorty, that no good. I take it back. I bite my tongue. There were a lot of nice things about Shorty. Like what? Like the way he'd buy me a little present sometimes from the empties I gave him to sell. He worked for you? You paid him? That wasn't work, relative. To Shorty, it was a labor of love. I had to force my empties on him. Well, that's how he lived. Bought a place to sleep, something to eat. Oh, my Shorty had other sources of income. Like what? Like Joe, the junk man. Shorty sold him things he found in trash cans. You'd be surprised the things people throw away, lover. Where do I find Joe? Over a night toward the river. Have one on the house, Danny. While Goldie goes in the back room and cries. Your name, Joe? Who are you? You're open pretty late, aren't you, Joe? It's almost 11 o'clock. Make junk at all hours. They stay here to sort it out. Now, who are you? Danny Clover, police. Is that junk? On your feet, Joe. I'm busy. On your feet. Stand up. I want to talk to you. Better. You get your 11 o'clock jolly this way? People got to stand when they talk to you. Want to talk in your backyard or mine? Talk. Did you know Shorty Dunn? Did I know him? I know him. He's been murdered. So? You know anything about it? Look, to me, Shorty was bottled. He brought bottles and I paid him. All it means to me that Shorty is dead, that I'm going to have to find someone just as good with bottles. That's all, huh? What do you want from me? What I got here is junk. And who brings it here is junk. Where did Shorty hang up? A question. He held out his hand on corners. Who knows what corners? He slept in doorways. He slept at the mission house. He 
Slept in those tenements over there. Over where? Two of them, right over there. You can see them if you stand on your toes and look over the fence. Deserted. Condemned. You know how tenements get? Like people get. I wouldn't have known it was you. Shape, shadow, something left over. Let's go. You're looking for something, Danny, in this tenement? That's why you called me? Uh Uh-huh. If it's not asking too much... Something that'll help me find Shorty Dunn's murder. The problem? Something he may have left. Slept here sometimes, the man told me. Look for it, Muggerman. Okay, Danny. You take these rooms. I'll go on down the hall. Yeah. on the throat. I'd say she's been here a night, maybe more. Anything else? Yeah, this purse I found laying beside her. Open it. Yeah. Uh, compact, lipstick, tissues, a wallet, no money, a picture of a little boy. Identification card says Mrs. James Bryan, 1946, West 146. Case of accident, notify James Bryan. Danny. Huh? Isn't this the Mrs. Bryan that was reported missing? The one her husband? Yeah. That one. And she was here all the time. What do you know about that? What do you know? You are listening to Broadway's My Beat. Written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. There's a time on Broadway when the street has not yet come into its own. The empty hours, the useless hours between dawn and noon. Broadway scrubs its sidewalks, tries to sweep the hours away to pile them in the gutter. Dies the unlighted neon, checks the sleeping masses of the spectacular, and longs for the time of darkness. But the daylight clings. You must find a way of rejecting it, a kid. Brush it, huh? Because what kicks are there when the sun shines down? Except this item, maybe. The item in the paper you picked out of the trash bin. Missing woman found, it says, in condemned tenements. Murdered. And this one. Derelict, stabbed to death in flop house. That'll hold you, a kid, to a night time. Sure it will. And at headquarters, a man comes in, oozing with information. You know that because he tells you. I'm oozing with it, Danny. Oh, oh, the bits and pieces I got for you. Uh, You'll give them to me, huh? Naturally, but piecemeal. First, Detective Muggerman has even now picked up Mr. Bryan. They are on their way to the morgue to identify the deceased. Well, tell me the rest of the way there, huh, Sartaglia? If you promise to let me keep up with you. I promise. Second, on the person of the deceased Shorty Dunn was found $20, undoubtedly from the purse of Mrs. Clara Bryan. Now, go on. Thirdly, our boys have checked with the manager of the flop house. He tells them a guy he could never describe bought a bed at his hotel, registered as Joe Jones. Slept for a while next to Shorty. Got up, walked away. Nobody knows where, nobody cares. Except us, huh, Danny? Well, what else? Hey, Danny, not so fast. What else is fourthly? A list was found in Mrs. Bryan's purse. It appears to our experts to be a shopping list. It so appears to me also. You got it? Well, naturally. Give it to me. I had so intended. Uh, it's not necessary for me to go in with you, Danny, into the morgue. It spoils my day. You can go back. Thanks, Danny. Uh, 
spectacle of death on a flat lit by a single boat. The chill wind that spilled into the morgue rocked the light gently, and they appeared each in his turn. A policeman, a dead woman, her husband, Stark. It needed another quality, not another spectator. I left. Now there was a list. Mrs. Bryan had intended to visit four places. A ten-cent store on a side street off Upper Broadway. A lending library close by. A place called Mildred's Beauty Shop. And a Dr. Johnson. Whether she had gotten to these places or in what sequence, I didn't know. I had to find out. Yes, sir? Something I can do for you? Uh, my name's Clover, Mr. Libby. I'm from the police. Police? That's right. Why? I mean, why are you here? As a customer yes, or... a police. I want some information. Oh, I'd be glad to, but what information would I have for the police? Did you know Mrs. Clara Bryant? The woman who was murdered? Yes. She was in here the other night, uh, the night before last. What time was that, Mr. Libby? Oh, I couldn't tell you that. I don't know. What did she buy? Well, you can't expect me to remember that. Every item I have in the store, 10 cents or 25 or a dollar. You keep a tab from your cash register of your sales. Oh, yes. Get it uh, from the day before yesterday. Mm -hmm. All right. Here you are. As you see, every item, 10 cents or 25. Hmm? There's a sale for $4.98, the last item on the tab. Uh, oh, the toy bear, the mechanical bear. I bought a shipment for Christmas. I, I remember now. Mrs. Bryan bought one for her Billy. Uh, that's her son. Then she must have been your last customer. Mm, she must have been. I closed at 7, but I, I don't have any idea how near the closing time she left. Not any idea. Hard. You run this place alone? Uh, a little bit, huh? <laughs> Different type. I asked you. Uh, to... uh, uh, I got another one coming over. <laughs> Different type. In the nose. Every fall like clockwork. Uh, you'll pardon me while I take my assistant. <laughs> you uh, asked me something. If you ran this place alone. Uh, that's right. Absolutely right. All alone. That matters. Then you knew Mrs. Clara Bryan. Not as well as I would have liked. Ever see her? I mean, before. Shouldn't have happened to Clara. No. You've got a point there, mister. Yes, sir, you've got a point. Whenever Clara walked in, it filled the day for me. Maybe lend books to myself to read at night. What did it do for her? You're a policeman? Uh huh. I thought so, the way you ask questions. Very personal, very adapted. Then you'll answer them because you like the way I ask them. What it did for her, you ask? How would you know about a woman like Mrs. Bryan? I'd pass a remark. She'd smile. You know, that kind of Mona Lisa-like. Borrow two books instead of one. That was all? I asked to give her a book once. Anyone she wanted, any price. She let me walk her home that evening. But didn't take the book. That was the uh, night before last. Uh, don't crowd me. Not night before last. Two weeks ago. But she was here night before last. Yes, to return the book. Hated it, she said. I knocked off a day's rent. She didn't take another book out. Did she have anything with her? A package, mechanical doll? Nothing, just a book in herself. I noticed. Go on, Mrs. Bryan, I noticed these things. Every time she walked in here. <laughs> Which one's your wife? I'll tell her. I'm from the police. Well, bully for you. Which one's your wife? Well, I want some information from someone named Mildred. From me? What information? About Clara Bryan. Sure, I'll tell you about it. I read the morning papers and found strangled. You want me to tell you why? That's right. Clara was attractive. She was 35 years old and her hair didn't need touching. Had a nice figure and she knew it. She thought of it. Had a husband who worked too hard and came home too late. How do you know all this? I run a beauty parlor, and it's for women. You want to listen to some of them right now? Mrs. Conley's in there telling a hairdresser why sometimes she's sorry she got a divorce. 
Did Clara Bryan know any men? You say it so gently. Women don't say it like that at all. Did she know any? She loved her husband. What woman doesn't like a man to look at her? What woman doesn't like to be insulted? But Clara always went for her husband and child. She was in here the night before last, wasn't she? Yeah, she was. How long did she stay? Just a few minutes. Long enough for me to tell her we couldn't take her. And then she wanted to wash and set. Do you remember what time it was? Oh, I came back from dinner about 5.30. A little after that. About a quarter to six. And one more thing. Was, was she carrying anything? I think she had a book with her. That's right, she did. She told me it was a terrible book. Waste time and she was returning it. Did she have a, a toy with her? A mechanical bear? I, I didn't notice. Maybe she did. Do you want anything else? No? Can you pardon me? It's time to take Mrs. Westfall out of the oil. <laughs> Brian came for her appointment at six. She was only carrying a book, nothing else. Why did Mrs. Brian have to come to you, a chiropractor? Mrs. Brian had trouble with her back. She'd been coming to me for some time now, aches in her back, pain. I did what I could. I gave her temporary relief, but uh, what are you trying to say? I cured the symptoms, but not the source of her trouble. Well, that doesn't tell me a whole lot. Well, you understand, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a chiropractor. What I'm going to tell you is only conjecture. Mm. All right. The trouble was here, here in her head, not in her back. Meaning? Oh, there's a very glib word for it, psychosomatic. It's simple, really. She was tired of routine. She'd reached a point in life when she recognized the fact that what she had was all there was going to be as far as her life was concerned. She was restless. In her mind. Men? Clara didn't have the heart to do anything like that. Clara didn't. She permitted me that. To call her by her first name. I confess it to you. She knew I was attracted to her. And once when she left here, she touched my cheek and smiled. If she would have let me, I would have tried to make her happy. Believe me, Mr. Clover... She wouldn't let me. And that ended that. These were the four places Mrs. Bryan had visited before she died. When she had gone to the beauty shop, she had a book. She left there with it. Had gotten rid of it at the next stop, the lending library. Then the six o'clock appointment with the chiropractor. And the chiropractor was certain she didn't have the mechanical toy with her. And the man at the ten cent store was certain he'd sold her one. So the store had been the last stop on the list. Go back there. Hello there. I see you came back. Uh, that's right. Uh, how are you coming? With what? Well, you know, with the murder case. No, oh, not so good, Mr. Libby. I was reading the papers. I see where you boys found a bum in the Bowery stabbed to death. This happened while you were looking for Mrs. Bryan, didn't it? Uh-huh. You sound tired. Uh, mind if I look around for a while? Hmm? These... Boys, quite a collection. Do you have kitties? No, I'm not married. Oh. Have you uh, have you made any progress on the case? Some. <laughs> nice toy. You can take it with you. Maybe you've got a, a nephew. No, no, none of those either. Well, what do you figure the connection is between that bum and Mrs. Bryan? Pretty obvious. Hmm, obvious to you boys, not to a ten cent store man like me. Oh, it's like this. Our technical boys tell me Mrs. Bryan wasn't strangled in the tenement, but some other place. She was killed and then brought to the tenement. You think the bomb killed her, huh? I read where he had $20 in his pocket. Motive was robbery, hmm? No, that's not what happened. What happened is... I see you're staring at my 498 item. Those mechanical bears. You like them? What happened is this. Our bum, Shorty, was about to bed down for the night in the condemned tenement. He found Mrs. Bryan's body, opened her pocketbook, so she was, took her money and ran. <laughs> you boys sure just put Mrs. Bryan in the tenement. He watched Shorty do all that. Followed Shorty the rest of his life. Saw him write a letter at the mission. A letter? I didn't read anything about that. Taylor must have seen that the letter was addressed to her husband. Hmm. Well, how did you figure that without seeing what happened and all? <laughs> That's the only way it makes sense. Gee, I don't know. 
I stick to my theory. I still think the bum killed her. No, you're wrong, Mr. Libby. Shorty didn't kill her. The killer followed Shorty to the Apollo Hotel and killed him because he thought that the reason Shorty had written to Mr. Bryan was to tell him he knew who had murdered his wife. Mrs. Bryan was an attractive woman, wasn't she? I really didn't notice. Funny. Everybody else noticed. I didn't. Funny. All the attention I pay to people is what they buy. I I have a living to make. How many of these 498 uh, mechanical bears did you order? Uh, six. Funny? What's funny? One, two, three, four, five, six. There's still six here on the shelf. What's that got to do with anything? You sold one to Mrs. Bryan, remember? What? But you never took it out of the store, did you? After you killed her, you put it back on the shelf. She... She teased me. She looked promises at me. When I wrapped her packages for her, she'd stand close to me, and when I looked at her, she'd turn around and walk away. The other night... The other night, she looked tired. I invited her in the back for coffee. She said, all right. She went back and slouched down in my chair. I looked at her. I brushed her hair back from her cheek. She started to scream. Something happened. I... I strangled her. hunger complete with eight beat rhythm and spinning me on. Grab yourself a dream and dance a while. Close your eyes. Make believe you've got your arms around something good. Keep them closed. What you're holding is stuff. It's Broadway. The gaudiest. The most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Presents, you've been listening to some of the best in radio drama with Fibber McGee and Molly in Broadway is My Beat. Join us again Monday evening at the same time, 9.05, when FEN presents Dragnet and Escape.